For those guys that don't catch us now, so episode three, Pitch and Paul, uh, Talking Balls. We are live on Facebook. You'll notice this week that there is only three of us. Um, Dan is tied up this week, so he cannot make it. So he's allowed us out by ourselves. Uh, and hence the technical at the start because we've not streamed to Facebook before, so it's taken us all week to work it out. But we managed it. Uh, so I'm Steve Bailey. I am joined, of course, uh, by Liam Pitchford and Paul Dringall. Um, and we're going to talk some more balls. Big thank you to all the guys last week who commented and joined in our discussion um, and have shared and liked things. It's massively appreciated, guys. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about a different topic. But before that, as is tradition, boys, what is in our glasses? <laughs> Let's have a look. All right. What have we got, boys? Yeah. I've gone back, back to go for a coffee. I'm feeling a bit tired today. Which is down. Pick, is that a game of drones mug as well? Is that a game of drones? Yeah, it is. Winter is coming in the Pitchford household. I've got. I've just got a coke. Straight, straight coke. Bit of, bit of a sugar. Is sugar it coke or is it Pepsi? It's been, it's been a long day's coke. And is it classic Coca Cola? It's not any of the zero stuff, is it? No, I said that if it was Bales. It's cool. uh, I just, I just like to make sure about these things. I'm extremely particular about my carbonated drinks. And what have you got? You've just got some. I've actually got. Um, you got... two boys obviously know, but I don't drink. I'm not a drinker. But seeing as we all said at the start of this, we'd all have a drink. And there's only me doing it. Um, I've got, a, I've gone rock and roll, and I've got a strawberry and lime Copperberg. Get okay. up there. That's what. That's I'm, not what sure. I'm, not sure. I'm not sure what to say to that, to be honest. That's what I, think we need, <laughs> I think we need to apologise for what happens in the show. Yeah. yeah. Whatever it's happens. That or smell I apologise for the drink he's drinking. I yeah, think. I know how to live. Right, boys, okay, so uh, in the absence of Dan, we're still going to do the famed quickfire round. So who wants to go first? This is where we find out a little bit about us behind the scenes. Who wants to go first? One of you two. I'll, I yes. can ask for, I'm asking you, Anna Bales. You're asking me? Uh, am I? Is that right? I'm asking you, I think. Okay. Fire away. Right. So, no, nothing that spicy this week, I'm afraid. Um, you ready? Yeah. Sure? I'm certain. <laughs> right. Day or night? Night. Flowers or chocolates? Oh, chocolate without a doubt. <laughs> chocolate. Tea or coffee? Coffee, tea's awful. All right. Uh, fish and chips or roast dinner? Mate, it's like asking you to pick between Dougie and Bonnie. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm asking that later. You took a question. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go uh, fish and chips. Fish and chips, really? Um, last one, open or closed? Open or closed? Oh, closed. If it's a door on a night, you can't sleep with a door open. <laughs> that's, just, that's, it, that's when the monsters get in. It's however you take it, open or closed. <laughs> <laughs> They're already in, mate. They're under your bed. Oh, man, don't. I won't sleep, especially after a glass of this. I'll be half cut. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, pitch to Paul. Right. Well, you already, you already know one of my questions. So, uh... <laughs> Go on, then. Oh. Fire away. Right. Film or TV series? Film. Oh. 38 mil or 40 mil ball? 40. Can't yeah. remember 38. Seems yeah. like an eight. Dec it seems like a yeah. lifetime ago. That's where I'm sure. That, that's, for the, that's for the older generation. I don't think you ever played with a 38 mil ball, did you? I don't think I did. I think they were just going out as I came into the sport. I feel so old. Um, KFC uh, or McDonald's? Good one. Uh, McDonald's. Massive shank. Yeah. Bar on that. Controversial. Bar. Um, yeah, you know this one, Dougie or Bonnie? <laughs> um, <laughs> Is it you? you know. Donny. Donny, yeah. Good answer. <laughs> Nicely done, mate. Yeah. I wonder if he'd have thought of that if he had less time. Because I think he's been like, oh, I need to think of an answer. Give me a bit of credit, Bales. No, no Bale, I thought it was quick. Yeah. I it was quick. I stopped asking. Give you that one. That's much higher than the usual standard. Yeah. Right, okay, meet the pitch. Meet the pitch. Uh, I'm asking pitch next week, sorry. Yeah, go. Yeah, here yeah. he is. <laughs> Virgil van Dijk or Mo Salah? Cool. Van Dijk. Great shot. He's what a class. Guy. Yeah. He's a colossus. What an absolute guy. Yeah. Um, 
Simon Gozi or Hugo Calderano? Oh, um, <laughs> um, Pictures on good the question. <laughs> Calderano. <laughs> Can't think why. Chinese or Indian? Indian. Okay. Mm. You've already asked. Not me. McDonald's or KFC? Oh, I'm going to have to say KFC. Yeah. Sorry, that's it's hilarious. I had that on my original list as well. Sorry. I, mean, I love the hot wings. No, hot wings from KFC. Yeah, yeah. You're a hot wings guy. Um, and the last one, nice and straightforward. Agnes Kariki or backhand flicky? <laughs> <laughs> I can't throw under bus three times, <laughs> three times in a row, so I have to say oh, Agnes. Oh, you can do that. So you're going for Agnes? Yeah, I'm going for I Agnes. I should bloody hope yeah. so as well. Pitches back. Course, mate, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> he needs a Sunday night in his bed. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. He's sick of the same uh, night, poor lad. That's why I'm tired. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, boys, I think we should uh, talk some ping pong. This was something, uh, a little topic that has been kind of asked a couple of times, actually mentioned by people. And I guess it could go off into all different types of direction. Um, and that is the training styles. Obviously, you boys both started in the UK. Uh, Paul attended the National Academy pitch. I know you spent a lot of time in Sheffield, then Paul National Centre in Sheffield. And then, uh, Paul, you trained, obviously, all over France, Germany, China, Italy, Belgium, all these places. Liam, I know you've lived in Sweden, Denmark, I believe. Obviously, Oxenhausen in Germany. Um, so yeah. you boys have got a lot of kind of international experience about what goes on in different countries. Um, and all different coaching styles. So it's really to kind of ask what you guys think about that. And we're going to start with the UK. Paul, I'm going to start with you on this one first. Um, obviously, I can remember you the first time you yeah. took the bat and all these things many, many years ago. So if you can tell us a little bit about when you started and the type of stuff that you saw in the training hall, the type of stuff that was communicated to you as a player from coaches, um, and if you think that was beneficial or it could be improved, do you want to talk to us around that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I'm glad you remember it because my memory is terrible for it stuff like it. this, but it, it's obviously set, it's in there somewhere. Um, but I think, I mean, obviously I started, I didn't start at coming through Ormsby, I started with Steve Brunskill and people before that as well. Um, but I, I think, Generally, most coaches I had, which I was very lucky at, they were they were workers. Yeah. Um, even Dave Pashley before Steve, it was like. Sorry, Paul. So how much of, time did, did uh, you spend with these two coaches? Can I just ask? So you started when you were seven, yeah. Yeah. Um, I honestly I can't remember. Um, I don't think it was that that long in total because, again, I think with me and Bryn coming through together. Um, and already having a background in tennis and things, I think we we sort of stepped up the ranks, if you like, um, quickly. And they both passed us on um, to the next step. Um, yeah, I mean, again, I, I don't know. My parents have probably, they will know that, but and Bryn might even know, but I, I don't know exactly how long it was. Um, uh, and then, I can remember you two had not really played much when you first came to Longford. No, and I mean, bit, but you didn't really have any strokes to speak of. No, um, and I think, I, I think from again, very lucky. Even then, the first two coaches that we had uh, were very much about working hard, um, and you know, if you want something, you've got to work for it, basically. And then, obviously, getting moved on from them, going into the the club environment that that was at Ormsby at that time, um, and obviously, all you lads. Um, a lot well quite a lot older than me yeah. um and a lot better because you've been obviously playing for a long time and been playing tournaments around the country and things i guess at that point and um yeah i mean there was older players i had not started that really yet but i was just about to but you obviously yeah. stepped into like a squad if you like yeah and i, I was, was I, I think what was what was good for me is i was the youngest but i was also the the worst in that level and and i think that Back then, what well, it was very good that it was was it beginner, intermediate, and top, top squad. squad. So, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it was like oh, top squad, baby. Yeah, um, yeah three squads. But I, I think that was really good as well, and I don't think that happens so much anymore because it's obviously it's it can 
put people down if you're not in the top squad and things like that. And I think the sort of thinking and mentality has changed a bit on that. Yeah. Um, but I think personally that helped me. Um, you could see the the stepping stones that were there and again, yes. the work rate that you needed to put in to get to that next next level. Yeah, so, so there was like a definite path. Pathway, yeah. And, and you could see the level that was at the top of, say, the beginner level and then the levels that were above that and what they were doing and how they were training and things. And um, But again, I, th- I think very much sort of from my family a lot was you know make sure i'm enjoying it and have fun and obviously work hard but and then from the club and from the coaches and from the players that were setting examples which was very good as well players were setting yeah. examples of working hard they weren't just saying work hard yeah we had that g- going on and not doing it and um, so yeah i came i came through that that sort of system where it was you know if you want it you go out and get it and and I think, again, that's obviously it hasn't changed now, but I think um, a lot of it now is, you know, looking at what could be or what could be better and this, that and the other. And, yeah. you know, again, I, I was very lucky to come up and have that sort of, it wasn't on my doorstep, it's like half an hour away or something, but it's not that far away. Um, and some people don't have that. But at the same time, you need to, you know, if you want something, you, you've got to make it work yourself. And I think training wise that is a way you can do it you can control your training a lot better yeah than you probably think you can okay um just before i come to liam on that because i'm quite keen to find out your background as well and i think i will do this it makes sense that then obviously we'll look at where you went from there so we can see what training styles Mm -hmm. you've got paul i can remember when you were seven and you first came to Wormsby and you and Bryn have been shown how to hold the bat i think you weren't both at any standard really um and the coach still the, beat Tim, didn't I? <laughs> very probably, yeah, uh, very probably, despite the fact he's about six, seven uh, years older. Um, you were sorry, always very Tim. competitive, even at seven, but I can always remember that the beginner coach Thelma had said to Carol Miller, who was the coach of Top Squad, that I'd just moved into and I had the same experience. I was in the kind of intermediates and I was like, oh, I want to be in Top Squad, you know. Mm. So there was that thing way, Matt, which I think is important. Um, it said, you know, there's a, there's a young kid here and his brother, yourself, and Brain, who I think are both really natural. And I can always remember that um, Carol put you on the table with Steve Nuppel just to watch him. It was a good mm. player um, and it would have been better if he'd had better players to... He's an actor now, he didn't stay in the game before, but he was a great guy. Um, and she showed you the basic kind of technique of a foreign drive. Um, and in those days, obviously, you would hold the player's arm and kind of guard it for them. Yeah. He was seven-year-old and she showed you two or three times and she let go. And you just carried on going with almost perfect technique at seven year old. And to be fair to Carol, I can remember this like it was yesterday. She stepped back and said, He will be European champion by the time he's won. She said that there and then. <laughs> See, is that actually what she yeah. said? Uh, yeah, she honestly did. She that's said, probably why it was, champion. to be fair. She said, He'll be European <laughs> champion by the time he's 14 because she thought that, you know, obviously you were very natural and mm-hmm. all these things. Um, and to be fair, you were. So, oh, yeah, yeah, kind of 40, 50, that I can yeah. remember really clearly. Okay, so pitch obviously, I know a lot less about how you came through, but I'm keen to find out. So, what did you first think of the game? Your first coaches and influences? Yeah, so I mean, I was quite lucky. Obviously, I come from Chesterfield, and you know, with regards to the UK, it was not a bad table tennis sort of, you know, we had Alan Cook, Brad Billington, Nicola yeah. Deaton on the women's side. Yeah. Um, and Nicholas Ladd at the time, Colin was still involved. So he kind of, you know, started at local school, then went into a club that he was running. And I don't know if you ever met him or knew him, but he, you know, he just had, just managed to get people into table tennis and loving yeah, table tennis. And, yeah. Um, and he, yeah, that's when I first started, really. But I think I was quite lucky because I started pretty much with two of my very, very, good friends, um, Sean Cole and Danny Lowe. Um, you know, we used to go to the same coach and at that time, you know, we were 10, 11 and, he, and the coach used to set us sort of like drills, but you know, there's a competitive edge to it. So we always had to try and beat each other um, and stuff like that. And I think for me, that was massive. I mean, I love competing and I always have to try and be the best at everything, even though, you know, even if I know it's not possible. Um, so no, it's possible, really, Liam. Sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Good point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, we kind of pushed each other. And, you know, even though 
we maybe didn't have as good practice as some of the other places in the UK, we, we managed to always find a way, you know, we progressed through cadet junior England teams together. Um, Can you remember anything specific about when you were very young? I mean, how old were you when you first started in? Yeah, like uh, about nine, really. Yeah, nine. nine or ten. Can you remember um, anything in the training hall or anything you practised in particular? Was it general stuff? Is there anything that sticks in your mind as something that you think, you know, I'm glad that that was instilled in me? Or is your memory um, terrible like Paul's? Yeah, my, <laughs> my memory is, is terrible as well. But um, I don't think, at that time, I think, you know, like Paul said, it was, it was about enjoying it and having fun and trying to, you know, realise where we could go with it rather than, I don't think there was a, a specific focus. Maybe, you know, maybe that's not the best thing. Um, but, you know, it kind of worked for us. We were allowed to express ourselves and kind of make our own style on the game, really. Yeah. OK, that's really interesting. Obviously, um, Paul coming from a background that was very, you know, I mean, the, the guys that we grew up with and played in that top squad, there were some tough, tough boys. You know, it probably maybe didn't look like a, a table tennis hall as much. I mean, there was some, some guys in there that would probably be more suited to a boxing gym, to be honest. <laughs> But, um, if you made a mistake when you were practicing with them and Carol wasn't looking, you'd get a clip. Um, but to be fair, they were all like Carol in those days used to keep them in line to, to give her credit. She was a really, a really tough coach, which is definitely what those guys needed. And Paul obviously stepped right into that. Paul, I can always remember you being very competitive, like what Liam's been saying. You were very competitive as a kid. And even if you were playing somebody who was miles better than you, if you they lost, obviously. <laughs> well, honestly, if you lost, there would be a tantrum. Do you know what I mean? The bat would be going down and there'd be all sorts yeah, of Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a massive part of it. And I, I think, like Liam said, they... You know, oh, I broke a few it, bats in my time just to... Yeah. <laughs> if any young players are watching, that's terrible. Yeah, yeah. awful <laughs> stuff. But, but, but again, you know, it is, it is, it's not what you'd teach or anything like that. But for me, if you see it's coming from the right place... It's passion. You know, it, 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 you say it's passion. It's, it's that competitive edge. Like Pitch said, I think... I think you need that. And again, I think sometimes now it's it's dragged away from that a little bit too much from a yeah. too young age because people are worried. And, and again, it, it all depends on how and where you want to go with the sport. And also the individuals. I think some individuals maybe you need to take a little bit of that competitive edge away slightly um, so that they can get a bit more fun out of it and but but don't drag the competitiveness out of them. Um, but also you need to, you need to like Pip said, whether it's an exercise, whether it's matches, whether it's even something to do with the warm up, if you're doing little sprints or something, make it so that it means something. Because I think yeah. then when you come to a match, when uh, two years, three years later, and you're you're in a match, you you've got that edge, and you're you're willing to to jump or to to do what it takes to win that point that you need to win. Yeah, I mean, I can remember I if I was to beat to... Dickie Chapman, he used to chase me around the table. And if he caught me, he'd be <laughs> trying to beat me up. He's my best mate now, but that's, that's genuinely how our, our squad was. I, I remember in the chicken hut, I was, I was sat there on the little blue bench, and yeah. the next minute, you just, you're, I think it was you running for your life around the table and Nick, yeah. <laughs> Nicky's running and then yeah. next minute you have to run out and go out. I think it yeah. oh was that Nicky and Don? I can't remember. But. Not, well it was probably any one of us pitched that's that's the kind of environment that we came from. Yeah. You know I was like an eight year old going just you know when I <clears throat> when we were coming up uh, you know Sean and Danny um, we used to you know we didn't used to have really you know a lot of options to practice so we had a local club that you know opens I don't know Tuesdays and Fridays so and Sundays maybe so we most of the time Friday night we'd go down to the club it'd be open for two hours we'd just go in and we'd just so, just play like best of sevens or you know just yeah. play matches and yeah that was kind of our practice at the time and it was but always competitive yeah always competitive I mean we, we, <laughs> we had some some big matches yeah no, no one was <laughs> like to lose I tell you <laughs> no but I think it's a good point that you both make and I think that we're at a risk these days that we're protecting young people so much they're not going to develop that kind of resilience that they need in the yeah. world to compete you know um, it's kind of medals for all and all this stuff I do understand it I'm no expert but I do think that we're you know maybe not going to develop champions that way and they're not going to push on that way um, yeah. but let's see if this is different in other countries I mean Liam where did you first move to and how old were you was it Oxenhausen you went when you were 16? Yeah 
Yeah, and how did that differ? Is there anything there that you think that you know that really made a big impact on me? The difference in the environment, obviously. Yeah. It's a club, I mean, so I'd kind of been involved so shortly or briefly in Sheffield, you know, at the National Centre before I moved to to Germany. So I'd had you know practice with Jai, so that was tough. Yeah, kind of. Jai, yeah, being with coach. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, when I went to Germany, it kind of opened my eyes to sort of a a new level, like I said last week, a new level of table tennis. And um, yeah, I mean, it was tough. Like, you know, for me, I hadn't really practiced full time. You know, I'd been at Sheffield for a few, I don't know how long exactly it was, you know, a year or two. Um, so I went out there and, you know, I was living a professional life, you know, table tennis every day, two sessions a day. And just, you know, I think. How long you did young, you train for? How long did you train for? Um, I mean, it, it varied really, um, but you know, two and a half, three hours um, each session, so six hours a day. Yeah. And I think I needed that when I was young. I think you do need that when you're young. Um, so for me, you know, I, at that time I was young and bright-eyed and bushy-tailed and all that. And I, you yeah. know, I, I love the, you know, it's what I wanted to do. Um, and who was your main practice there? Oh, I had. I mean. Some of the I played I've played with some of the best players in the world. You know, started off I was there with um, Apollonia, Garcina, Shkachkov, Freitas was in the practice group, Kamal. Um, yeah. So you know, I was day in day out learning, even not practicing with them, just watching how they practiced and yeah. just taking it all in. Managed to play with Rusal Min for a few years. Um, he actually taught me a lot. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think just I don't think he practice. taught I don't think he taught you that backhand though, did he? <laughs> no, didn't teach. He <laughs> tried to teach my footwork, but I don't think it works. <laughs> I, I you were like, no, listen, I'll just stand here yeah. and play backhands, right? And you yeah. can do all this footwork. He, he can <laughs> rip a backhand when he wants to, I tell you. Yeah, he, he can. Really can, really can yeah. So, what about in terms of the exercises then, pitch? Was it different? So, let's say you get up, you warm up, you go on the table with one of these guys. Yeah. What's the first thing that you practice? I think for me, you know, when I went there when I was young, um, so the younger players, they had like a group of younger players and, you know, mainly we kind of did the same exercises. It was more of a, you know, sort of bulk training, you know, get the hours in, yeah. um, get the footwork moving. Whereas, you know, the first team and the, the older players were, you know, were doing specific things, which I, you know, came on to do as I progressed through the ranks. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you know, it was a lot of footwork. Um, Regular footwork. Tired legs. Yeah. Irregular, regular, strengthening, small movements, big movements. Mostly, uh, you know, in the mornings it was um, regular exercises, and then it, in the afternoons a lot of or well, a bit more multi-ball and irregular exercises. Um, yeah. A lot to, yeah, to just to get the you know basic footwork right. Um, I think you know for me. Growing up in the UK, I don't think I was taught everything necessarily right. I think, you know, I adapted and, and made it my own, made it work. Um, so when I went to Germany, a lot of it was, the first few years were spent on trying to, to build everything right um, so I could progress even further, you know, quicker. What do you think improved the most in that first season? Was it backhand, forehand, legs, service, service receive? Because it's really interesting to go from England to... A yeah. different culture, a different training hall. Yeah. What do you think really jumped? I th I'd say definitely serve and receive. I think a lot more detail was put around that, um, yeah. especially for me. Um, just also a lot spent on how to build the points. Um, I learned a lot, you know, if you if you do a specific flick and then you, you move out, how, you, you know, what you want to happen. So building the yeah. points like that. You know, yeah, combination type yeah different combinations whereas I think before that I, I tended to you know play the same way had one game plan um, yeah. whereas I learned a lot about my game you know that it was variable I could do different things um, I didn't have to be one dimensional okay that's really interesting that's obviously picture Ox um, Ox Nelson and sorry where I know that you came on a lot so if we come to Paul yeah. for a second Paul do you want to describe your first experiences, I, I obviously know that, you know, you came through on through those and then you worked a lot with um, Jai Liu, who I believe is in charge of Singapore now, is that right, Paul? 
No, he's retired, he's retired now. He stopped. God. Finally I mean, retired. He's a absolutely yeah. world class coach. Fantastic knowledge. You boys, I'm yeah. sure, would agree. Um, and a lovely guy. So yes, obviously coming coach, coming yeah. coming from that Paul, um, you then obviously lived in Italy, you went to Germany at different points. I know you didn't go and live in Germany like Pitch did. What did you find from them ages, say seventeen to twenty, when you went abroad? Did you notice anything different? I didn't. Did you add anything to your style? I went I went abroad. I don't know when it uh, when did Sheffield close pitch, yeah. Oh, I went abroad, I think, just just before was it? was it just before or just after the London Olympics? Yeah, and you went to Italy, didn't you? Yeah. I, I, it might what about the, what about prior to that in terms? Because obviously you did train in Germany. You, you trained a little bit in China. Yeah. Was there anything about the table tennis in particular? Not so much about the environment, but anything that was different think, to say the England style or the English way of coaching and teaching. I, I, I spent a lot of time, quite a lot of time in Dusseldorf. We seem to have a, a, a good relationship with them. And um, and who were the guys Garrett. at Dusseldorf? It was. Uh, I mean, I, I remember a lot of battles with Lars Hilscher um, in the training hall. Yeah, Bastian Stegers, Christian Zeus, yeah. um, and Ofterov was there at times. And you know, a lot of uh, basically their national team. It's basically their national centre. And yeah. um, I remember spending a lot of time there, and again learning a lot on the match side of things. So not necessarily always playing matches, but um, and I think I learned a lot there about. Like like Liam said, with a serve and receive, when even if you're practicing, for instance, I don't know, back and middle, back and wide, adding a serve and receive beforehand, I think you know a lot of people add serve and receive, but they don't care about the serve and receive. It's yeah. just to you know, get to the exercise, yeah. And yeah, and then there's no point in adding serve and receive. And I think I think that happens a lot, and people throw the serve in, the receiver doesn't really put any quality on the receive. So then the third ball becomes kind of irrelevant anyway, and then you're into an exercise. Um, and I think the quality that they were doing on that sort of thing in Dusseldorf for me was amazing. And, and it just it showed how and what you needed to do to be able to get to that sort of level. And when you, know, when you see them guys play matches, you know there's, it's not luck that they're getting 95% of first balls on the table. It's because they're constantly practicing that and practicing at a high level and yeah. um, obviously with the group they've got they're, they're constantly pushing each other with the national team they've got they're, they're fighting to get games for their club they're fighting to get games for their national team but I think the one thing for me that stood out when they trained anything they did the the intensity and the quality you can set you, it meant something to them yeah I think obviously you know I'm going to speak about England because that's where I've yeah. grown up and played um, but I think everybody wants to improve and everybody including me this was when I was younger you want to improve you want to work hard you want to do the right things you don't always know what that is so you have to you have to experiment and try to learn but I, I, I spent a lot of time experimenting and doing things but I wasn't really fully committed to what I was doing so I, again I was I was serving a ball in to do start an exercise and that's what I was doing. I was popping, I was popping a serve in, you know, there was no placement. There was nothing, not trying to change the length on the serve. So, and, so there was no real intent in that service and receive. Yeah. It was almost just a means to an end to get to the exercise. Whereas in Germany, it pitch, it sounds like you've maybe had a similar experience that focus on serve and receiving those details that you mentioned yeah. as well, pitch. It sounds like that's a massive thing. And certainly it's something that, you know, I would, I'm nobody to criticise, but I would say that in this country we maybe spend a little bit too much time on that and not learning point winning, if you like. Yeah, I, th I think that that's the thing. I think a lot of people do it and a lot of people start with serve and receive, but, but like you said, there's no intent there. There's there's no real specific target to... That's, that's what I think is missing in a lot of practice yeah. here and around the world right. is... And from a young age as well, like like Pitch says, very important at a young age, you get the hours, you get the time on the table. Yeah. But then hours also, you need to be learning about yourself, learning about where you want to be, how you want things to go. And again, you're going to experiment, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to change your ideas, but nothing really works. And it's kind of a bit of a waste of time if you're doing it half-hearted because you don't know then if it does work or not. Yeah. Um, and, and again, what being in Dusseldorf, you could see the youngsters coming in and players 
a, a little bit older than us. Um, but you could see the quality and the things that, that they were practicing with. And I, I, I quite, quite quickly had to learn um, because the players wouldn't be interested if I was just going in and throw, you know, not trying to be at the quality that they were at and, and sort of going through the motions, you know, you wouldn't, you just wouldn't get invited back. And yeah, of course. Yeah. Of yeah. course. So um, that's, that's, that's really interesting. Pitch, do you want to talk us through? Cause obviously then you left Optimhausen. Was it after three, four seasons? I know you were there a while. Um, yeah. Five, five seasons. Yeah. And in that time, yeah. I mean, I obviously watched you go from being, you know, like a, a, a young kind of threat. Yeah. You know, Paul's corner at the Nationals and stuff. And, you know, so then obviously turning into, into an absolutely class player. Um, you then went to, is it, is it Denmark or Sweden you went to next? Yeah, Sweden first and then, then Denmark. Um, and how were the experiences after. there? Was it different again? What type of players did you play? Did you learn anything yeah. differently? I think it, it was it was definitely different. I think, of course, you know, different country, different mentality, um, different culture. How I was the mentality Sweden, different? How was, um, how was it different? I think it was a little bit more laid back in the practice, still, you know, serious. Um, but it was, I'd say it was more, everybody was more individualized. So I learned a lot from uh, Matthias Falk, actually, you know, for me, when he came to the hall, he knew what he wanted to do. Um, he maybe didn't stay the longest in the hall, didn't practice the most, but he knew, he knows what he's got. Yeah. And he comes in, he works on it, full quality, full quality and then, you know, he goes and does his thing. He won't waste time in the hall. He won't, you know, maybe do three extra exercises with no quality. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not getting anything out of it. And he's just wasting time. For me, yeah, I learned a lot from him um, about that. Yeah. yeah. About that side of things. And who um, was the coach there, Liam? Who, who were the uh, coaches Tick and, players in Sweden? Uh, Tick and Carl, Carlson. Yeah, of Carlson. Um, yeah. yeah. So he was. You know, I don't know if you know him, but he's a tough character. <laughs> One day you, you never know what you're going to get with him. But um, I mean, obviously, I don't, you know, sadly, sadly, I don't know him. But he was obviously former world doubles champion, former Swedish yeah. national coach for many years. Yeah, so, very good know. coach. Um, and I, yeah, I think he helped me a lot. I think at that time as well, I started to work with um, sort of mental coach, psychologist. Um, and I think for me. So obviously, you know, being in Oxenhausen, I was practicing with some of the best players in the world. Um, obviously, I was going to improve quickly. Um, but maybe I'd, maybe still at that time, I didn't really know how to practice smart, Yeah, I would say. Whereas, you know, when I started working with mental coach on different, you know, side of things than table tennis, I learned a little bit more about myself and my game and started to to be able to practice cleverer and get more out of my game. For me, I think, you know, everybody now in table tennis can play backhand forehand. You know, you can see people doing 2-2 two, two and everybody can play. Yeah. Where you win matches, you know, is serve and receive. Um, and the small things that generally you won't see in most people's practice, I think. So I learned a lot um, during that time. Yeah, that's really interesting. And then Paul, I mean, I know you went to Italy and worked with Yang Min for a while and played over there, um, amongst kind of other places. You've you've kind of been around a lot. Do you think that there's? And this is an interesting question, really. Do you think that is there's? It, um, <laughs> is it one you thought of, Bales? Or? It is. It's <laughs> one that I came up with all by myself. <laughs> I've been with my little yeah. pad and pen. This um, should be interesting, then. Well, I'll tell you why I'm going to phrase this because obviously. You know, Paul, I was fortunate to work with Jai a little bit when he used to come to the club. I used to practice yeah. with you. Technically, like, for me, his knowledge is absolutely incredible. So you worked with him for a lot of years. Do you think that there's a particular coach that you've learned something from or a little thing that, that counted so much for you? Obviously, you worked with Carol. You then worked with Dennis Neal. You worked with Jai. You spent some time with Yang Min in Italy, different coaches in Germany. It's... I think um, it's hard to get into that debate of who's the best coach. That's that's ridiculous because yeah. coaches help different people in different ways. Yeah. Yeah. But what do you think about was there something in particular that you really learned from someone that thought, you know what, that 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 was a game changer for me. That was something that I can pinpoint. Um not necessarily. I think like you said, it's it's very hard. You you 
basically as a player you've got to try and be like a sponge so you've got to try and soak everything up um so you think it's good to get all different coaches perspectives yeah i think there's times in my career where i i i got too much so when i was coming up and i was quite young i think sort of back end of juniors but i was i was good for my level i was playing german first league and um so you know you're playing pressure matches out there and the coaches expect you to do certain things but then I was still working with Jai at that point and he'd he'd actually advised me to go to Sweden because I'd have a bit more freedom on that front um but obviously as a player I was thinking well I've I've been offered you know a contract in best league in Europe why yeah. why am I not going to take it and um again who knows if it was the right or wrong decision I think I learned a lot from it um Maybe in Sweden it might have been a little bit easier to to keep doing what I was doing in the training hall and keep control of that more. Um, but I think, as you say, there's so many things that you can learn, and even even if there's you know something said that you don't not necessarily agree with, but you don't it doesn't work. You try it and it doesn't work. Um, you've learned that that it doesn't work. So even though, you know, some people turn around and say, Oh, that's rubbish. That that's all a load of rubbish. Actually, you know, if that, if, if 10 players try it, no matter what it is, that, you know, there's a chance it's going to work for, for one of those players. Yeah. Um, but I mean, I think for me just, just recently, obviously now life's changed Two kids, um, very difficult to live abroad. Now I still spend a lot of time traveling around and things, but, I, the last few years I've really had to try and make sure and I wish I'd have d- done it before um, that every single second I spend on the table like Pitch said like Matthias is very good at every single second you spend on the table is for a purpose and for a reason and sometimes that's to sweat and to be there for two hours and work hard and and get through so when you're retired at a tournament that's you know that session gets you through that yeah. but I've learned a bit more recently as well like Pitch said working with somebody almost from outside the sport, more on the mental side of things and learning that such small things in a way can make big differences. And I think, um, you know, sometimes the small things get put to the side very easily because you don't necessarily see or feel immediate vast improvements, but actually, you know, when you get to your game or if you keep working on it with high quality, in quite a short period of time, you can notice a huge difference in your game. Um, okay. And I think that's something I've improved and learnt um, recently in my career. Okay, so um, just before I come to pitch on that then, who do you think as a coach had the most influence on your game? Who are some of the coaches that you, that you work with? Obviously, I've listed Carol Moore, Dennis Neal, Jai Liu. There's others, obviously, that have worked with you over time. Um, um, All these coaches have spent different amounts of time with you as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, you say I'm sitting on the fence, but I've learned so much from everybody. Like, you you know, if if I didn't have Dave Pashley or Steve Buntskill, I would never have got to Carol. If yeah. I didn't have Carol, I wouldn't have got to Jai. If I didn't have Jai, I wouldn't have got to wherever. Yeah. Um, See, so, you know, I can't that would be kind of taken away from the, from, if I don't say their name, I'm not, I'm taking it away from them. And for me, each and every one has helped me just as much as the other. And I mean, I spent my longest time with Lou Jai. Yeah. He was like, for many years, he was like a second dad, you know, cause I was obviously very young and we were traveling around and, um, you know, I was learning how to live as well from him, you know, obviously like it wasn't just on the table things. It was, you know, be, being a human being as well. And, um, and he he gave you and Darius Knight at that time a very different game to what the others in the UK were playing. Though he gave you much more of that Chinese third ball direct style. Less yeah, absolutely. Being, but you know, I can remember that yeah. change in you. Obviously, seeing you when you went from Ormsley and then you coming back, not just in terms of the improvement, but in terms of the change of of style as well. You know, yeah. Um, that, and I, I absolutely loved working with Jai and got so much out of it. And. But again, I, I loved working with all the coaches and I got a lot out of every single one of them. Yeah. Um, and so many different things out of, you know, if I didn't get the things that I got when I was 12, then maybe when I was working with Jai at 15, you know, I wouldn't have been able to progress from that point if I didn't have my basics that I got from the others that, at the start. Yeah. So, you know, sorry not to give an answer, but there, there is no answer there. 
Yeah. There really okay. isn't an answer. Pitch, what do you think? Do you think there's a particular coach or a particular time when you've thought, you know what, that was really, we'll say life-changing, but kind of game-changing for me? Um, was there a particular coach? Do you um, think, do you know what, I learned so much from them? I think, like Paul said, it's very different. Like, obviously, coaches when I was young, you know, if, you know, like Bob Porter and Mel Buxton, and then obviously I progressed on to like Jai, if they weren't there, I probably wouldn't have, you know, but they, they knew when to, you know, let me go and, you know, they couldn't take me any further. And Which is I'm really important, to... I think. I think that's a mass, yeah. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, coaches need to know when, you know, they, they can't take um, a player any further. And then, you know, they, then you have to look for somebody else to, to take the next steps. And I think, like Paul said, it's very difficult to pinpoint um, one coach specifically. I've learned a lot and taken a lot from every coach I've worked with. And there's been different points in my career when, you know, I felt, you know, that's worked. Um, yeah. Some things haven't worked. And then there's been another point where I've tried something different and that's worked. Um, Who was the coach in Oxenhausen? Um, Dubravko Skoric, so he was a Croatian guy, so he coached Charleroi before, so he worked with, um, yeah, Primrak and uh, Save, yeah, so a lot of top players, so for me, he was really good in the hall, like, he was in the training hall, he was, he was really good, um, so I learned a lot from him in my first few years there, um, and then, yeah, progressing and different coaches have shaped me into different things, um, so it's difficult to say one name, like Paul said. Okay, I'll accept that point. Sorry, I'll just, I'll just go to, uh, I remember one point as well of actually a coach I wasn't even working with at the time when I was in Bremen and I was going through my injury and things. Um, and I, I remember I'd sort of been given the go-ahead to, I'd been training a bit and been given the go-ahead to compete again. Yeah. Um, and it was Lutian Philemon. I don't well, know if many. you know him. Yeah. 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 Um, mm. But he lives in France and I actually went on to play for his club after that. Um, but it, it just, I, I think he put my mind at ease a little bit with my injury and I sort of felt a bit of freedom, freedom coming back because I was, I was worried that, you know, I was going to get back into my first competition and my hip was going to go again and that was going to be it. Um, but yeah, just, I had a couple of minute conversation with him and, and, sort of that made that point of my career a bit easier um yeah. so that was a and it wasn't even my coach like yeah. we, we knew each other and things but it was just um yeah it was that was a, a good moment a good point i think there um or one that i find really interesting i think that other countries maybe do this better than the uk people can obviously disagree if they like um is that i think there's coaches who are good in the training hall there's coaches who are very strong on technique yeah. There's coaches who are very good with younger players. There's coaches who are better tactically in the corner in matches. There's coaches who are better at managing the team and managing players. You know, all these skills are there. Um, like I would say that Jai, I used to watch him working with Upal and technically I just Sorry. thought that... M Millie's jumping up on Sofri and she's struggling, bless her. She's no, up to Can we meet Mick? Yeah. Paul's, Paul's a little dog, Millie. Lads. There she is. There she is. There she is. Um, she's our little mascot. Yeah, this is lovely. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's all kind of different coaches who are good at different things. Like Jai, I yeah. think, was amazing technically. Was mm. he the best in the corner? Maybe, maybe not. You know, there's all these different I, kind of strengths and qualities. It, and I, wondered if, I wondered if it was different in different countries. I, I think it is. I think yeah. that I think there's a bit too much of that that goes on within table tennis. It's like I'm... In this country or in general? I'm, in general, in table tennis, it's... You know, I'm. You're in that position, so you control absolutely everything in and around that. But it, it's it's life. You know, humans have got strengths and weaknesses, and in in everything. And I think it need, it it could be spread. Obviously, again, it all comes down to funding because if you need if you want somebody else in that role, then you need to employ somebody else. But I think, like Liam said, it's very important that coaches know know what they're good at and know what they. They're, they're, I'm not saying they're bad at, but they maybe need a little bit of help from the outside or from something. Yeah. Um, and and I think that in tail tennis, it's whether it's people are too proud or there's no other options. But I think that you know, I think 
again, tennis is totally different sport and different things, but, you know, it seems that people have, have got different angles covered with different members of staff to, to help them out. Yeah, okay. It's certainly something I've witnessed over the years in this country. Coaches will say, you know, you shouldn't listen to them, you should listen to this. When really, Paul, you made a good point earlier. Pitch, you said that some of your coaches were very good at saying, right, I'm going to pass you on now. Yeah. You know, which which is very good, um, rather than have just you, saying, you know, all, you got, all different things are good for different people. You got Facebook Live on, Bales? I think I can hear myself talking in the background there. No, <laughs> it's on. It's on because I'm looking for the for the comments and things, but it's definitely on silent this week. I learned. Is it? <laughs> I learned my lesson. I've come a long way. It's all a good right. example of you know you you criticise your performance and you learn. From yeah. it. Can learn something from you there, boys. Okay, something so, else, but sorry, yeah. can I just? I don't know, if, but something that I think is very important from a very young age as well, or as young as you can, and um, get it going in training is like goals and planning around training. Yeah. Again, I, you know, I was sort of advised as a young younger p- player to do it and things, and um, but I what I didn't really feel that I it was sort of just do that. You know, and at, at the time, I didn't really know the the thinking behind it or anything, and this, that, and the other. So I think I agree. The, com- the, the competitive stuff, I think, you know, pe- people you can say people have got that or they haven't, but I think you can you can work on that with with people as well. Yeah. Um, but I think the planning and and the you know, I think too many people go into a training session, the coach sets an exercise, they do it, and they walk out. Yeah. You know. You, nobody's really getting anything from that. And I think that's, again, maybe when it falls on the coach and the player to step back and say, hang on a minute, what am I really getting out of this? Yeah, because I need... how much do you know about your own game? Yeah. Um, I, I can remember I got a phone call a few years back by a guy who was playing the National Junior Championships in a couple of weekends and we needed some practice. So he dragged me out um, and he set his first exercise. said, right, what's first exercise? And he might have said Falkenberg or too far on yeah. or whatever. And I said, right, why are you practicing that? He said, I, I don't know. Yeah, it's an exercise, isn't it? That's yeah. what it is. And he thought mm. I was saying, like, you know, why would you do that when I was saying why? What's the objectives? Yeah. Is it yeah. footwork? Is it consistency? Is it timing? Is it, you know, yeah. is it... And, and again, I don't, he, he couldn't tell me. I, I don't think yeah. there's... And this is a I good don't think There's no wrong, you know... You, you might do certain exercises when you've got a bit more time in the summer to make sure you can get you know, the fitness, the footwork and this, that and the other, you know, two weeks out from a tournament, you might have a bit yeah. more planning and, <laughs> and say, do you know what? I'm going to work more on my strengths now um, yeah. to get my confidence up to go into this event. And I think that's an important thing. I think, especially again, coming up through the training in England, what I've done is a lot of the time is working on weaknesses and yeah. absolutely you need to improve weaknesses but in other countries and i think sweden's a good one for this is they work on their strengths they especially before tournaments before big events you work on your strengths you get your confidence up and um, of course you touch on your weaknesses still even within them last few days but you don't make it so that when you're going into the tournament you're thinking about your weaknesses um, and i okay. think that's something that can that can really improve pitch what do you think about that yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, definitely. I think for me, um, touching on the difference sort of between Asia and Europe now, I think for me, you know, the Asian countries focus a lot on that base core game when they're young. Yeah. So, so like a basic technique, yeah. a good solid foundation. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, they do that until they're ready to progress, you know, to the next advanced stage. So, I think with Asian players, you'll find they've all got that, you know, if they're under pressure, th- there seems to be, you know, more of a... It doesn't break down. Yeah, it doesn't break that, down as easy, I think, as, yeah, as, you know, UK probably more than some other parts of Europe. Um, I don't think the kids necessarily have, you know, that core game. I don't think they're, you know, if they need to fall back on it, I don't think the level is where it needs to be if they are put under pressure, if you get yeah. what I mean. So I think the Asian countries, you know, do that yeah. well. Um, you know, I think it's, to, yeah. Ron Paul, sorry. Yeah. No, do you finish, Pitch? Sorry, I thought you'd finish. Yeah, yeah no worries. Have you finished on that? Yeah, no, I was just going to yeah. say, if you go to a call in China and you see, you know, kids five, six, they're all, you know, doing the four and top spins and they can all, you know, play a hundred in a row. Um, yeah. I don't think if you go to a hall in Europe, you'd probably... See that? Yeah. 
And it means yeah. that then a 10 all when when the pressure's on, you see the Chinese yeah. and yeah. They, they don't break down. Yeah. yeah the pressure. For, for me, what's it, I think what with that, what I get from that feeling in the UK and Europe, I think it it's very much like a rat race. Like, of course, you want to be as good as you yeah. can from a young age. But I think because, and it, it probably comes down to a little bit more of, in a way opportunities and coaching because you know in in the uk there's not many places where you can go and train a lot or train full time and things like that and um, whereas in asia that they have more centers to do that so i think they're getting that sort of experienced coaching from a young age um, and yeah. whereas i think in the in the uk and in europe people want to be as good as they can as early as they can so that they, they almost try and take shortcuts and again you might it might it might give you a quick jump start in the first two years of your career or your first yeah. four years of your career. You know, you might be 15 and, you know, be flying, but like Liam and both, like everybody said tonight, if you, if you don't have that core game and you don't have them, what you'd call simple things to fall back on, yeah. you know, you know, when it comes to it and it's not saying you can't work on it later on because you, you can always kind of touch on it, but the best time to do it. And I think that's where the, they do it really well in Asia. They do that and get it to such a high level, the the core game and base. And I think, to be fair, we did that a lot, Ormsby, and a lot of the sort of what you'd call yeah. the boring stuff and, and yeah, get the, fo- the technique and the footworks and the different things set there so that, as you say, when you're nervous and things, it's so, it, you don't even have to yeah. think about Second it. Second nature. And, 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 and One it, of the biggest there. things there, Paul, you know, that I can remember, um, which again, you probably won't because your memory is absolutely diabolical, is uh, at the time. I re- your... Sorry, I, what, one thing I do remember is when your hair ca- came down to the bottom of your back. That can't be true, there, can it? <laughs> I, I can't like forget Axel that. Rose. I love that Axel Rose. <laughs> picture of that. More like Mary Rose. We, yeah, we do, we do have a picture. picture. We'll have to believe me. Post there, that. Is, there is pictures, but they will never see the light of day. I promise. <laughs> um, so yeah, I can also remember that. But what I can remember is yes, we were taught those basics. Pitch. I don't know if you ever played when Spiegel was around, but. I used to go to tournaments. Yeah, and yeah. I was like 15. I didn't start playing. I was like nearly 14. And I had a good basic technique and I was better than some players. And we're all using speed boot. And at the, at the time, arms with your coach had to say, look, you're ready for speed boot now. Um, yeah. And it, it was because Carol wouldn't let us do that until our technique was ready. Mm-hmm. You know, whereas some young players were gluing up, the technique was all over the place. They didn't have the good basics, didn't have the good foundations. Yeah. And the other thing that I can remember as well, Paul, you probably will remember this. We were always taught when you're under pressure to go back to what you know best. So the first mm-hmm. stroke that we were taught wasn't the push. It was actually the forearm drive. Yeah, I remember it. Now, the reason why we were taught that is the whole psychology around it was that, you know, again, like we talked about the Chinese, when you're under pressure, it's juice. You'll go back to what you know best. And at that better level, you can't be pushing the juice because you're going to lose every game. Mm. So we were taught that forearm drive and that loop first is look, when it's tight, you play positive, you play your way. So it was like a psychological thing. And I think it probably worked. Um, whether the forehand loop was the best one for every player, but the intent was there of yeah. learning something very, very well so it didn't break down under pressure. So that's the environment that we came from. Liam, it sounds like you allowed a little bit more freedom. Um, a couple of yeah. questions here that I think is quite interesting that's come through um, from Alvin Salado, which is an absolutely amazing name. You sound like a rock star. Um, do you think at a young age you have to go and train in Asia rather than in you. In Paul, you went to China fairly young for periods of time. Liam, I don't know if you did. How important do you think that is, boys? I think, I think, uh, I think you need to go out there and, and witness, you know, how they train and, and how they do things. Um, how, for how long it is, um, that's for everybody to decide, you know, how long they want to stay there, really. So, but yeah, I'd say definitely, um, it's definitely important to go out there and, like we touched on that, learn that base, base game really. Yeah. To learn a good foundation, solid technique. Yeah. yeah. Paul, what do you think about that? Do you think that you have to go to Asia, or do you think that? But just, like, I, just like, I don't, I don't. I'm not saying like you have like it's necessary. I think you yeah. can also do it if you don't. <laughs> But I, I didn't really spend that, sorry about that, I just dropped my phone. <laughs> <laughs> <Good up. laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't expect, go to China too many times. I think I think the first time I went was, um, I can't remember if you remember, 
I don't know if you remember before that time in the singer party as well, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, when we met Gordon yeah. Brown and stuff. Um, yeah. But yeah. Um, so that? I was yeah, at that time like 14, 15, so I wasn't really young. Um, yeah. So Paul, you obviously went younger and a little bit more at different phases. What do you think? Do you think it's essential? How important do you think it was in your development? Did it play a big role? Did it play a big part? What was the... Yeah, I think it played a massive role for me. Um, I used to spend at least a month a year in China, probably for, well, yeah, three to four, three to six weeks a year um, for, I don't know how many years, for a long time. So I... I I spent a lot of time Speak there, Chinese, but do I? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, but I think I, I think it's I think it's something that you know once you get to a level to a good level and you you realise that you want to be something in table tennis and you want to progress. Yeah. I think absolutely, like Liam said, I think even if it's not a regular thing, I think and you, again you can't go there and and just expect to come back and play like, yeah. you know, if you go to China, like the Chinese play or play like this, but if you go there and work hard, I think, I think it's very good. And there's not many places in, especially in the UK um, but or in Europe where you could spend two weeks in the summer um, and get so much table time yeah. um, as you do. So it's almost like, a, like Liam said, to get them basics and things, it's almost like a crash course to do that but you're doing it in an environment where there's coaches that know what they're doing. As long as you go to the right place, I'm not saying every place in Asia is going to be absolutely amazing just because mm. it's in Asia. Yeah, but um, there's, there's a lot but, more strength in numbers and depth, isn't there? There's a lot more. Good y- yes, definitely. But I think also as well, what it can, you know, as a person, as, as a human sort of developing, I think it could be really good for, for young athletes and young people in general to go out there and to learn um, and to see, yeah, I mean, I when I used to go so the first time I went, the I, I was we went for a month, and I think I left the building that we were in once. Good, like good. Well, that should be, and and that was to go literally fifty meters away to get a little ice cream. Literally, that's what it was. Ice cream. Um, absolutely, <laughs> yes, Stephen. That was about <laughs> the only thing that I liked eating that trip. Um, <laughs> but literally, there was. We walked in massive hall, um, two or three balconies, and all the players lived there. Um, and for lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, we walked through the hall up some stairs, and you had your food there. You just, we were in this bubble, and after a while, oh my oh, god, was, I that, even was that a provincial centre? Uh, <laughs> I can't remember anything. Because <laughs> <It, it was, laughs> obviously it, it wasn't the National Centre, was it? Was it maybe no, it was, yeah, it was, it was like, like a, enough there, man. It was, yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was a club. It was, you know, one of the top clubs in that area, so probably a provincial centre. And, it, you know, it had a lot of good plays. And again, you could see they'd, they'd sort of, they had the beginner, intermediate and top squad sort yeah. of thinking with it. Yeah. Um, eight rows of however many tables and we went out as a group of five or six um and actually paul i think one of the guys that went with brad evans has just logged on has he he, on brad. Yeah. he was there brad yeah. can maybe remember if it was a provincial center or just some club or, we're know, just talking about the club brad, brad we went to you know, when, um, when we were about well, I'll tell you what i tell you what i think yeah yeah not in newcastle um <laughs> we um i, I learned a lot about life on that that trip like incredible like you were like just 11 weren't you i was 11, 11 and i was there with i was there was me brad matt kenny greg baker dale barham with dennis neal as the coach was darius um, there yeah i don't think he was on that trip uh, no i don't think he was no i might i might be wrong with that but i'm not rem- i'm not remembering him there okay okay um I might be wrong well, i'll tell you one thing i can remember when you went to china Pitch, you know, last week I talked about when you had that season where, you know, to me, you turned up to the Nationals one year, I didn't see you from one year to the next. The next year you came back, you'd grown a beard, you were about a foot taller. Your game <laughs> yeah, had improved, like, like so I don't know. <laughs> honestly, like, your game was just through the roof. Paul, I can remember, I think you were 14 or 15, and you went to China, I'm tempted to say, for three months. Um, and you came back, I mean, you went as, 
you know, like a kid. I think who, it was six, six weeks, eight weeks, something like that. Maybe. A month and a half. You, you went for a period of time, you went and I was still kind of beating you, but you were getting good at the time. I, I was all right and I was training a lot, very fit. You came back and honestly, in those six to eight weeks, I've never seen anybody improve more at anything. You came back I remember coming with four back kids from with hairs <laughs> on your bloody legs. And honestly, you were so strong and so fast. You know, you'd really yeah, improved. I, and that was that intense. I, I remember that trip. It, it was that was a trip where you came back and killed me. We, you actually killed well, me. We, you know, you go to China, and obviously they train hard and they train a lot and it's up in the hours, it's up in the intensity. Um, but Jai upped it again, so we'd be doing extra on top of what they were doing. And yes, Jai. Like Jai. Yes, Jai. <laughs> uh, honestly, he had me doing like frog jumps daily. Like I can't, I, it was a set number I had to do each day or something. Well, this is, and you like, know, I'm talking about you kind of coming back, the muscles in your legs, because you went as a kid and you seemed to come back a man. Uh, I remember I came back in. So yeah, I know. It's been a tough life. It's been a tough life. <laughs> it was um, ridiculous. But I do, I do remember that. And I think Brad might have been on that trip as well. But um, that I do remember my legs just constant. Like I was struggling to, I was struggling to walk because of my muscles were just in bits. Yeah. Um, and but again, like you said, I came back in about three, four weeks after coming back because that's the other thing. You know, I don't think you know you you put in hard work you do them things you can't expect and you might never get it but you can't expect to see immediate improvement so most of the time when i did go to say asia or china specifically when i practiced hard and did all that work I, when i came back the first two or three weeks i'd always think ah, like if i just if i wasted that trip somehow well like, you're joking happened? aren't you because not... paul <laughs> let me tell you now you came back from that trip and you practiced with me i think it was the monday night top squad and honestly I was like, what is going on? Serve short of the forehand, I, I received. That, By the time I'd finished the receive, the ball was past me. And that's I was also thinking, the trip I started playing with Hurricane, I think. Yes, that's right. I think that was the trip that I the, said, you know, well, we're here long enough, I'm going to... Yeah, it was yeah. massive. It was absolutely massive. Dave Godbold has just asked a question, actually, I think people would quite like to hear the answer to. Big shout out to Dave, legend table tennis and Sunderland, great guy. Um, how does Europe compete with China, given what Paul's just described, pitch. What do you think about that? How can Europe do that? Because we don't have the numbers, we don't have yeah. loads of dedicated facilities. So how can Europe find a way? You're obviously somebody who's right up there. Now I, mean, I think, I think the we, we kind of did we brush over this on the on the first episode. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, like I said, then it's it's tough. Like it is, it is just tough to to see. You know, in the you know, up few come upcoming years, really. How I don't think we'll ever have the amount of players that China can produce or Asia can produce. I don't think um, that's possible. I think if we can somehow come together more as a continent, maybe, and practice together more. Because I don't think, you know, especially at UK, we don't have enough good players to practice with. Um, to get enough out of it. I think you know that's what, the same across most countries in Europe. I think that's really interesting. I'm going to pick up on something you said earlier on that because what, what you said was that when you went to Sweden from Germany, Germany was a lot about the details and the hours and you know that kind of intensity. Paul's talked about a similar thing, intensity yeah. with four players in Europe, different to England. You said in Sweden, you learned from the likes of Matthias Falk and others yeah. how to practice clever and get the most... So out Matthias. Of <laughs> now, when... Is he German, um, huh? <laughs> when when Paul was younger, you may not may, may not know this, but obviously the Swedes, one of the smallest populations, managed yeah. to beat the the might of China, and they they found a way to do it. So I'm wondering if you know you said you went to Sweden, you found out about getting the most out of your practice. So yes, you yeah. don't have all the coaches, you don't have all the players, you don't have yeah. all the centres. Yeah. But you know, is it is it possible that you can find a way that works for you, Paul? You mentioned about coaches. Ten players might not like this advice, but it might work for one player. So maybe it's about training cleverer for the individual rather than kind of one. I, that yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. I, yeah, I think I think that I think I think it is possible, and I think like people are showing it now, like pitch beating Xu Xing there in Qatar, and and again that is an absolutely massive win. But for me, sort of when I saw it, I, it it didn't it wasn't a huge shock 
No. Like, and and I don't think it should be. And I think. No, I agree. And I and I think that's that's a good thing. And I think that again, I mean, amazing achievement. But it's it, it's not for me knowing pitch and knowing what he can do. And again, look at other players and what they can do. It's not a shock. It's just content like consistently getting that performance for me is the key. Yeah. But I think again, what what we talked about tonight is getting that that core game and that balance there from the beginning. Um, and so I think. I think long term on that, you've got to build up the bricks from the bottom a lot better. Yeah, across so if, the the UK if, in if Europe, the, the foundations are very strong. Yeah, and and I think that starts from again, however long it takes. But you need you need clubs that you know with with good good knowledge going in there. So when kids turn up, you know that the first two years they're getting the things that they they're going to need to to step up to that next level. And I think. I think that's where Europe and other continents are chasing Asia because, again, I'm not saying everybody out in China or Japan or Korea or these other countries sort of know exactly what to do in table tennis, but I think there's a lot more purpose and there's a lot more numbers of people who who do understand it more. So when a six-year-old or a five-year-old goes in, you know, they're not just picking up a bat and, you know, hitting the bat and ball up and down for months trying to improve. Yeah. You know, they do that for the first day and then they've got somebody there who can take them straight to that next step. And within a few months that you can see already, they're getting a bit of technique and stuff. And I think that's something that needs to be built up and the knowledge from players, coaches and different things needs to be somehow shared. It's very difficult because even, you know, if you share it and you can't always have an influence if you want an influence. And as I said before, Good, good comments and good knowledge from some people are not going to help everybody. Yeah. Um, so I think an openness from po- coaches, staff, parents, because I think parents have a lot to do with, you know, how well and how how good a child can get and how open a child is to learning um, and to trying new things. And I think that is something that in Asia, you know, the parents. If you go to table tennis hall to learn table tennis, that once you get into that hall, the table tennis coach is technically the boss, um, yeah, and then obviously, yeah. you know, you're there as a parent. But at the same time, you, you're you're putting your child with that coach because you want them to learn table tennis. So I think sometimes it's better as a parent to step back um, yeah. and let let the let the the people who know what they're doing do it basically. Really interesting. Okay, so just before we come to our last little point, Dimitri Yates has commented, um, I don't believe Zhu He's a regular, lost, isn't he? Uh, he's a regular. He's a regular. But I don't believe Zhu had lost to anybody outside of China before, I think. No, he has, mate. He has. He has, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's yeah. Championship. that's not Maybe, uh, watch, yeah. watch the world. He, he lost to Gauzy. Gauzy was over the moon. But that's not... Go on, Dimitri, you're slapping. You know what you're on about. Well, pitch's achievement is fantastic because Zhu can play a little bit, to be honest. He's not bad. He's um, all right, isn't he? He's, he's all right. Yeah. He's all and right. it was he on needs, a Sunday. He needs to work on his <laughs> yeah. footwork a bit. But, I mean, apart yeah. from that, he's doing all right. Um, so the last little thing, just before we kind of head off, boys. Uh, Are you throwing a curveball? Right? Sorry? Is this, is this a curveball? I can feel it's, it. It's, it's a bit of a curveball. I have to keep <laughs> yeah, it on your toes. Really. This, this program is all about honesty, right? We don't... You guys don't know what we're going to ask, and I think I'll be back really in important. a bit, Bales. All right. No, no, you do definitely have to stay for this. I just, you, I've got. To, I'm sure I've got to do something. No, you've, got, just got, just you've got definitely off. got to tie a knot in it. Um, so, pitch. Tell me, please, the most beneficial, not your favourite, the most beneficial regular exercise that you feel a young player should do. Probably one that you've obviously experienced yourself. Table tennis. Um, yeah. <laughs> Regular exercise. Regular. Oh, um, are we incorporating like we incorporating serving receiving? Absolutely, pitch. Stuff? If you feel that would be beneficial, then absolutely, my friend. Um, right. For me, I think you know I've, I've always my forearm's always been my my weak spot. Or, Weaker, it's not that bad. Weaker side, Terrible. I'll say. Terrible. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to say. Um, so I think, you know, I, I spent a lot of time, you know, when I was coming up and, and trying to improve my forms on the regular side of things, sort of, you know, I'd start to come in and start with a backhand flick. And then, so a lot of times I'd come in with a backhand flick and then I'd recover to my backhand side. 
Um, and then I'd be caught out on the forehand. So I actually started, you know, coming in, receiving on the backhand, and then obviously it was regular, so I knew where the ball was going, but then playing, you know, forehand from wide, forehand from the middle, forehand wide, and yeah. then play a backhand. So that's the um, opponent would serve short, you would flick with the backhand. Yeah. To a block, uh, or they would open yeah. up, and then you would do far and wide, yeah, far, middle, kick far and wide, yeah. far and middle, yeah. Backhand flicking. When I'm playing for a little kick. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for you, uh, backhand receive, and then far and middle, far and wide is a regular footwork exercise, yeah? Far and middle, far and backhand, yeah. Yeah, okay, far and middle, yeah. far and wide, then backhand, yeah? Yeah. Great. Paul, regular footwork? <laughs> Thanks for regular. clearing that up there, Bells. You just made it even more confusing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, you know... It's one oh, forehand from the yeah. forehand, one from the middle, one forehand yeah. from the forehand, <laughs> and then one backhand. Just yeah. for yeah. people who don't continue, understand yeah. whatever he was on about. Paul, uh, your thoughts on that? Sorry, can you repeat the question, please? Regular exercise. What do you think is the most beneficial one that you think that would help young players a lot from your perspective? Uh, good one. Um, <laughs> I think young players, I think... I think coming from my style, I think four and three points um, and mixing that up. So you've got one forehand from the wide forehand, one forehand from the middle, one forehand from the backhand side, <laughs> and then you skip you skip the middle out on the way back. So you've got, Ooh, you've got some small movements. Like, like, yes. <laughs> you've got some small <laughs> movements and then you've got the big movement on the way back. Heavy on and the then legs. And then again, after 25 minutes of that, you can switch to the other side. <laughs> no, so, so I think... To any coaches out there, he's joking on not on the 25 minutes, right? Like 10 minutes is okay. Maybe no. 12 if you're this point. Yeah, yeah I think, I, I think 10, 10 to 12 minutes footwork exercise is good. But I think the three points... and then you used to have us doing, didn't he? Yeah, you used to have us doing yeah. 15. But I think... Who did? Who did? Uh, Lou Jai. Jai did 15 minutes. I think the three points there and then you say the big big movement back and then you switch at half time or the next day you do it from the opposite side. So you start from the back end, then the middle, then the far side. And then you've got the big movement, which is a lot harder because the ball's going away from the way you have to turn around. Yeah. Um, so you've got, you're covering a lot of footwork in that and a lot of forehand. So if you're a backhand player, I wouldn't advise doing that. But from my, well. from my side... Being a, more of a forearm player, it's definitely better um, and a very good exercise. Okay, and the next one, the last one, uh, pitch irregular. What would you advise for a young player on exercise you think is particularly good? Um, irregular, I think. For me, <laughs> me and Paul love this one. A little back and back and switch. We, that's all we do when yeah. we practice together. Yeah, back um, and switch. About three I'll hours in, we're like, I've got an exercise. I've got, I've got a story about practicing with Paul, if you want to hear it after. Yes, please. Uh, no, it's, 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 you no, it's, it's good for you. It's good for you, right. I'll tell you. So it, it kind of fits into you know, practicing clever and stuff like that. So it was um, Halmstad um, World Championships 2018. And, um, I've been, you know, I, we'd played well. We beat Belarus first match and then Singapore. I beat Samson. So I'm, I'm feeling good. I'm playing well, you know. Yeah. No, and it's been countless times, you know, when I've been named Drell there, it? Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you want to pick that name up, Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, you know, sometimes there's been times in the past where I've practiced well, been feeling good, gone to a match and played absolutely awful. But um, I remember this time, it was about the time when I was starting to work with a mental coach on that side of things and practicing clever. And I remember we, we had a big day. We played Chinese Taipei in the morning and then we played Japan in the evening. So quite a big, to get through the group. And um, I'm practicing with Paul in the morning. And I, honestly, I don't think I won one point during the practice. I, I, off. I mean, it was, it was, you know, and I wasn't playing bad. That was the thing. I was, I, in my head, I was doing the right things and doing what I needed to do. But I couldn't win a point. So obviously, I'm saying to a coach, oh, I feel awful that... Like, I just can't win a point. What what did I do? But I think subconsciously I knew I was kind of doing the right things. Um, and got to the got to the table and actually played some of the, the best stuff I've ever played. So I just wanted to. I just pushing your pitch, that's Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. I know, honestly, I, I I didn't win a point. 
Uh, no, we, what, when you take beat, off in training like that, you're a nightmare, Paul. I've had that pitch when he was younger as well. He just goes did we beat him 3-2, 3-1? Yeah, we beat, we beat Taipei and we beat Japan, yeah. Yeah. Not bad, boys. Right, but not bad. Just a, that, just a little anecdote to, about practising clever. Like, maybe it wasn't that clever, but um, you know, I think in the back of my mind, I knew I was doing the right thing. So it yeah. kind of didn't lose confidence over it. Yeah. yeah. Trying to get at And Paul, what about you for... It, well, hang on a minute, Pitch, Ian didn't give her any regular exercise, he got out of that one. Oh yeah, I said back and back oh, and switch. Back and switch? Oh, back and back and switch, stick. Oh, right. I, I Paul, what about you? What do you think is really mate. beneficial? For back any, and back and switch. For any coaches out there, what do you think is a, <laughs> is a good irregular exercise, Paul, that you would recommend? I think this is one that we, we did quite a lot in Bremen. Um, Bremen, Bremen, whatever. Um, ah, yes, Matthias. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> is one or two backhands, one forehand from the middle, one or two backhands, one forehand from wide. Um, again, you've got the little movement, you've got the big movement, um, turning into in the middle. I think it covers quite a lot. And then I think as you develop with that exercise, you can you can start trying to play again after you've done your three points for five hours. You can start playing your <laughs> you can start playing your forehand from from the backhand yeah. side even within the irregular stuff. Um, yeah. So I think it, within that one exercise, you can cover quite a lot of basis. And again, like Pitch said, I think depending on your style and your receives and your serves and your third balls, you can always add, um, whether you start with a backhand flick open up or whether you serve, your opponent touches short, you can touch short back, they push long, you open up. So, um, so and I think so one thing... Starting with serve, yeah? I think yeah, so. From a, recommend starting with the serve. I yeah, think yeah. so, and I, and I think something, especially with the new ball, people need to do more of is not serving someone pushing long and you opening up all the time. I think sometimes your opponent serves, you push long, and they open up, and you're counter attacking, um, right, yeah. because I think now you, you the counter attack and stuff is such a a big part of the game. And I think again, when you look at the Asian players and especially the Chinese players they're so comfortable if someone gets in they're just there's no panic there's nothing they step yeah. step back give themselves a bit of space counter attack and then they're, they're on going again and that's not just because they're good at it they've practiced that over and over and over that's been a big change in uh, the game hasn't it obviously there's, there's a little bit less spin so people are opening up stronger with a flick or you know rather than touching short all the time so then that can't yeah. loop so for any coaches out there I guess that's a really Even good Paul's back and flicking now <laughs> I you invented know, it. I'm just not very good at it. <laughs> <laughs> you know this 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 whole banana backhand pitch, this, this flick that likes of David Macbeth and you boys do. It wasn't even invented when I played. You know, it was like Corbell used to do it a little bit. Yeah. And then you'd go to a tournament like right round it, wasn't it? Yeah, you used to. You know, you turn up to a tournament and these kids are all legging over the forehand side and doing these backhand flicks, and I'm thinking, yeah. I'd have been shot for that. Carol would have literally made me get down and do 50 press ups for. Yeah. Even dreaming of doing the backhand flick from over there, the game can change. Yeah. Okay, boys, I think we should leave it there because we've run over as we do. Uh, we've got carried Swaffle. away. Swaffle. So, um, big that. thanks again. Now, next week, this is important. Uh, we are being big blessed, one. boys. It's a big announcement pitch. <laughs> so, if we're all sitting country, we are being blessed. Uh, I'm on the edge of my presence of a very important guy on the show. We're hoping to have Dan back as well. We're hoping to have our yeah. fourth musketeer back. Um, but Matthew Stanforth. From Table Tennis England, um, it was a very close friend of mine and Paul's, and always made pitches as well. Uh, Matthew came through Almsbury with myself and Paul, and he's now the program manager at Table Tennis England. Um, and he's agreed to come on rather foolishly um, and <laughs> discuss things with us. So we're looking forward to that with Matthew. Now, what we'd like to say is that obviously Matthew's coming on, he knows a lot about the internal workings of Table Tennis England and their plans. He's in charge of things like uh, squad selection, policy, uh, funding all these type of stuff. And he's done various roles over his time in table tennis England, level four coach and work with the women and the men's teams and all these things. Um, so if people would like us to discuss anything, particularly with Matthew, I know we've all got I'm some sure ideas. there'll be some stunners in there. There's going to be the some stunners. <laughs> I hope you're already, watching, Matty. Yeah, yeah, we, Get me ready. Paul and, me, Paul and Pitch have already had a little chat about this uh, and we've got some <laughs> things we'd like to discuss with Matt. So if you guys want to hear anything in particular, uh, we can then obviously put that to Matthew 
Um, he's got a he's got a bad internet now, isn't he? Our internet's yeah. gone. Yeah, oh, so you don't know what he's walking into. He's going to struggle. I think I've lost my connection. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so if if anybody would like to comment and let us know if you've got anything in particular that we'd like to put to Matthew, um, then we would like you to do so in the usual way in comments. So big thanks to everybody who joined us, uh, and we will see you all Thank next you. week. Yeah. Cheers, boys. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Bye. See you soon. See, see you guys. Later. Peace out. Peace out.